a five o'clock Pacific time, so you know what time it is. Time for another episode of Eric Waite Live, and uh, tonight we are kicking off a very long series, as I like to do. I like to do long studies on whiskeys, whether covering uh, a particular type, particular style, particular region. We're going to be doing sherry and cherry cast finished whiskeys. This is something I have been talking about for a long time, been wanting to do, uh, thinking about, but one of the challenges is... Um, you have to respect the platform. You have to respect the audience and do justice to it because being the whiskey geek that I am, it can be very easy for me to sort of just pour on too much information that a lot of people are just going to sort of tune out <coughs> or present information on this platform that in such a way that it doesn't really, really work, right? The odd thing about being a whiskey tuber is we're talking about something which we, for the most part, just smell and taste. YouTube is a platform in which you can see and hear, but not smell and taste. So we're trying to talk about various senses which don't really communicate over YouTube. So you got to find other ways to sort of uh, get the message across. So uh, in July 2020, I taught a class on Sherry and Sherry Cast Finished Whiskeys down at the marketing school down in Texas after going through the level one course. And it's been on my mind to say, hey, look, I've already done the homework. I've, I've put the notes together. Let's take that same content and then sort of boil it down and put it on the channel. The problem is what you do in front of live, in front of a bunch of people in which you're smelling and tasting wines and then whiskeys, as you're going through your notes, it works. But when you're talking about a platform and a medium, which most people, hey, they got 10 minutes, they got 15 minutes, and you could very, very, very quickly lose them and they'll just tune out. It doesn't quite work. So for a long period of time, what has delayed me in really doing the series is trying to do my best to come up with a way in which I could present this material that will be engaging, uh, informative, uh, enjoyable, maybe some entertainment and all that. So tonight, really, really excited to be kicking this series off. Before we get going, let me say hi to everyone who is in the house. Hey, Josh Lowe just became a member. I think he's a second member uh, to this group. So we have Patreon members and then we have channel members. So thank you very much for becoming a Patreon member. Uh, excuse me, a group member. So that turns his name green and you get various icons and stuff like that. <coughs> I don't really talk about all that much. All right. So we had Josh Lowe who tuned in early. He's drinking a Glen, uh, Glendronic. 18 year old i will be reviewing a glendronic 18 year old uh alderas all no allardyce uh because it's aged 100 percent oloroso so when i'm talking about oloroso i will be aging one of those and it was previously discussed here in the chat because of the changes that are going on at the distillery um you want to probably start buying up the older bottles you want to grab those older bottles while you still can uh, Mark, thank you much for uh, tuning in. Mark with a C. Michael 2000, C2019, thanks for tuning in. Paul M., Michael Gonzalez, G-Man, Side Pocket Seth, Joe F., uh, James Morgan, thanks for tuning in. Mike Bennett, how you doing, sir? He says, uh, I'm port a weed dram on the Glenallachie, 15-year-old. Sounds awesome. Dirty Dog, how you doing, sir? Carlos C., hey, Whiskey Straight Out over in Ireland, thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, Chris McClure, and Adam T. And anybody who's tuning in um, on the replay, uh, thank you very much. So we're going to go super, super deep. If you are new to this channel, I think it's fair to say this is one of the geekiest whiskey channel, whiskey tuber channels out there. And in this series, I'm going to go more in depth than I ever have in any of my previous series. Uh, Craig Wadsworth, thank you very much. Or Wadsworth, thank you much for uh, the five bucks. Every time a Glenn Caring rings, an angel gets his wings. <laughs> I cracked myself up with that. Um, Carl Canuck, thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, Daniel Caballero, thanks for tuning in. And Adam T. And Eric H., thanks for uh, tuning in. Matt Mize, thanks for tuning in. So people, continue to roll in. Uh, so tonight I'm going to do an introduction. Now, um, the inf some of the information I'm covering tonight will, again, in other videos, the first one will be posted on actually Sunday, two days after this live stream, uh, in which I'll be getting into Fino, and I'll be doing 
a uh, 12 year old pheno cask from um, Tobermory, from Tobermory, an absolutely superb whiskey. Um, one of the things I'm doing is not only am I going more in depth and more complex, but I've been really sort of trying to learn to be a better editor and to be more engaging. So I'm hoping to improve the quality of the videos as well without getting super long. So these are going to be sort of dense, concentrated videos with a lot of content um, that I hope you're really going to uh, learn from and gain a better appreciation for whiskey. My two videos, um, uh, 10 whiskeys that every, 10 wines every whiskey lover should know and six more wines that every whiskey lover uh, should know were sort of a warm up and preparation for doing this type of video. So I'm doing a little bit of a shift here in how I do uh, videos. So uh, the class that I taught down in Texas, it was like three hours long. We did two hours and then had a lunch and then for another hour afterwards. And which, so the first two hours were spent just on the sherries. We went, covered uh, history, production, soils, climate, grapes, and all that. And then we had a lunch, and then afterwards, um, we went to Sherry uh, and Sherry Cast. We actually went to the Sherry Cast Whiskies. It was a fantastic event. Hope one of these days to do it again. I'm trying to, as much as possible, duplicate that experience. But the one thing I can't do, I can't grab a bottle and pour you a dram uh, through the, the whiskey, through the, through the video. Unfortunately, I can't do that. So I'm going to, uh, in an upcoming video that I'll be posting, uh, you'll be watching here in just a second, there's a list of sherries that I uh, will be reviewing, there, uh, that I recommend, and some of them I'll be reviewing. I will post in the Facebook group, if you aren't already a member of the Facebook group, you probably want to join it, the Eric Waite uh, Whiskey Studies. Uh, I can upload documents in there. So there's already documents in there for study exams, for the history of Scotch whiskey, there is uh, a sort of an outline on Scotch whiskey production. I'll continue to post stuff, but I will be posting uh, a document with that'll list every ahead of time. So if you want to buy some ahead of time uh, to sort of enjoy with me uh, along the way in the series. So I'll put a, a post of every whiskey and every wine that I'll be going through in this series. The series is kicking off on Sunday, month, uh, May 2nd, and will continue probably all the way through July, if not longer. The tendency is I keep finding, I will keep finding uh, whiskeys uh, with a particular sherry cast and I'll go, ooh, I want to do that one too. Oh, I want to do that too. So I do have a tendency for series to get longer and longer. But the current plan is this will go from May all the way in uh, to July. So uh, again, if you're new to this channel, I'm hoping to be able to convey the information in such a way that someone who's new, who, know, who knows nothing about wine, nothing about sherry, nothing about whiskey, can gain a lot from it, as well as uh, some of us older people, veterans, people who spent more time uh, getting into whiskeys, can gain from it as well. I want to reach all people, all audience is in, uh, in this series. Alrighty, so I want to start off with a video. Uh, it's going to be like 11 minutes long. And it is a shortened, abbreviated version of what I taught in the class down in Texas. So it went from, you know, two hours down to 11 minutes to sort of just the meat of what we covered, the essentials. So we're going to look at basically the region. We're going to look at the grapes. We'll look at a little bit at, at production, um, the various types of sherry and so forth. So, all right. So if you haven't already, by the way. After that, I'm going to get into three whiskeys that uh, I actually covered these three in the class. I will not be doing uh, individual videos of these. These are whiskeys I've already reviewed. So this is the uh, Redbreast Lustau. Lustau is a bodega down there in Sherry. So this is a Sherry Cast uh, Irish whiskey. Starting with that one, because I think in, in, in comparison to these three, it's not as intense on the palate. So I'll, I'll be doing sort of a short review uh, here live tonight. Then the Emerald Intermediate Cask, and we'll get into that. And then I'll finish it up with the big boy. This is the Balcones Broheria. This is quite the monster. In fact, I got to pour some now, put a little bit of water into it now, because it needs a little bit of time to get the water to really uh, intertwine with. All right, so. 
while I am pouring these whiskeys and adding a little bit of water to the Bahiria, uh, let's get into an introduction to Sherry and Sherry Cash Finish whiskeys. An introduction to Sherry and Sherry Cash Finish whiskeys. First, we begin with a definition of Sherry. Sherry is a protected designation of origin or DO. Therefore, all wine labeled as Sherry must legally come from the Sherry Triangle, which is in the area in the province of Cadiz between Jerez de la Frontera, San Lucar de Barmida, and El Proto de Santa Maria. Now, you may find Sherry wines coming from the United States. However, those were produced before uh, a protected designation of origin and they are not able to be sold in the EU. So Sherry is a fortified wine, but what is fortification? Most bacteria and yeast are rendered impotent in solutions of more than 16 to 18% alcohol by volume. Fortification is the adding of a high ABV spirit to a wine. If done during fermentation, it causes the yeast to cease fermenting sugar into alcohol. The result is a fortified wine with a high ABV and potential residual sugar. That spirit used to fortify sherry is usually made from Arian coming out of central Spain. Arian was once the most highly planted grape, but it has been surpassed by Chardonnay. Why fortify a wine? One, it makes the wine more stable, resistant to spoiling than table wines. Secondly, it enables the wine to be able to be shipped over long distances in less than hospitable climates. Think of old wooden ships traveling from Spain up to the United Kingdom. Third, the wine has a longer shelf life after the bottle has been opened. And fourth, it tastes great. There are two methods of fortifying. The first one might call the port method. Port is fortified during fermentation, which results in unfermented residual sugar. This is why port wines are generally sweet. The second is the sherry method, which is post-fermentation. Spare is added after the fermentation is complete. This would include sherry, Vinjean from the Jura region of France, and drier Madeira styles of wine. One of the most important factors in growing the grapes for making sherry is the Albariza soil. It is a chalky soil which absorbs a lot of water. If you were to take a test on sherry, this would definitely be on the test. Oloroso, Amontillado, and Pela Cantado are all made from the Palomino grape, also known as Listan. Palomino accounts for 90% of total vineyard area. It is named after one of King Alfonso X's knights. Previously, it was made with Palomino Basto de Jerez, but this has been supplanted by Palomino Fino. It is more disease resistant and has higher yields and responds best in dry sandy soils. But it is very low in acidity and has low fermentable sugars, picked usually around 13% bricks. Typical table grapes, some say California, are harvested anywhere between 22 and 25 bricks. Palomino consists of loose bunches of grapes, which make it suitable for table grapes, but also in humid climates, it enables the grapes to breathe and not suffer from mold due to the humidity. Our next grape is Moscatel Alexandria, also known as Muscatel Gordo Blanco. It accounts for only 3% of the total vineyard area. It grows best on sandy soil, mostly Chaponia. It is primarily used for sweetening wines, but some producers also bottle it as a varietal wine. Our third and final grape is Pedro Jimenez. It is grown on less than 100 hectares or 247 acres in the Sherry region. It was supplanted by Palomino. It is thin skinned. Some Solaris make a varietal PX, but mostly it's used for sweetening other Sherries. Oftentimes, Pedro Jimenez is imported from Montilla Morales. It is also grown in the Malaga region east of Sherry. One of the most important factors in producing Sherry, particularly the Fino Sherry, is floor which is Saccharomyces ellipsodius. This is a yeast film that forms on top of the wine. Floor will not live at alcohol much above 16% ABV. Bodegas are teeming with floor yeast, but many houses cultivate their own floor. Floor forms a film on top of the wine and protects it from oxidization. The butts are filled to five, six of their 600 to 650 liter capacity as you see in the picture here. The floor is sensitive to heat. 
It tends to die off in the summer in Mantilla, but survives in Jerez. It grows more thickly and evenly in the cooler, more humid San Lucar de Barameda and Puerto de Santa Maria regions. The flora would die by feeding off all wine nutrients, but in a solera, which we'll discuss in a moment, constantly is refreshed with younger wine. This keeps the flora alive for about six to eight years. Sherry is produced in a solera system, which is a fractional blending system. It consists of several rows. The top is the Silver Tablas, which is the new young wine. Then we have the second Cardera, the first Cardera, and finally, the last one's called the Solera. A maximum of one third of the wine is removed from a cask to go into the next criteria. The casks are never empty and never filled because they always have that space or that oolage at the top of the cask. Once the wine is finished in anywhere between four to seven years in the final row or the Solera, it is then bottled. A fino sherry, fino meaning refined in Spanish, is the driest and palest of the traditional varieties of sherry and Monta Morelia's fortified wine. The defining component of fino sherries is the strain of yeast known as flor that floats in a layer on top of sherry in a wine barrel. The flor is a strain of Saccharomyces yeast which thrives in air and the more oolage or headroom there is in the barrel, the more likely it is to develop. The flor acts as a protective blanket over the wine, shielding it from excessive oxidization. So finos are aged biologically, whereas Oloroso, Amontillado, and Pelicantado are aged oxidatively without the floor. And an Amontillado sherry begins as a fino. It is fortified to approximately 13.5% alcohol by volume with a cap of floor yeast, limiting its exposure to the air. A cask of fino is considered to be Amontillado if the layer of floor fails to develop adequately, two, it is intentionally killed by additional fortification, Three, or it is allowed to die off through non-replenishment. In other words, not adding any new wine. Without the layer floor, Amontillado must be fortified to 17.5% alcohol by volume so that it does not oxidize too quickly. After the fino fortification, Amontillado oxidizes slowly, exposed to oxygen through the slightly porous American or perhaps Canadian oak cast and gains a darker and richer flavor than fino. Our next sherry is Oloroso. Oloroso casks are the most common for aging whiskey. Oloroso means scented in Spanish. It's made in Jerez and Montemoreles and produced by oxidative aging. It is normally darker and nuttier than Amontillado. The defining character in Oloroso is that the floral yeast is suppressed by fortification at an earlier stage. This causes the finished wine to lack the fresh yeasty taste of the Fino sherries. It usually has fig, dates, and raisins, and those typical characteristics of dried black fruits. Without the layer of flora, the sherry is exposed to air through a slightly porous walls of the American oak cask and undergoes oxidative aging. As the wine ages, it becomes darker and stronger and is often left for many decades. And next is Pelo Contado, which is my favorite type of sherry. Pelo Contado is a rare variety of sherry that is initially aged under floor to become a fino or a manteado but inexplicably loses its veil of floor and begins aging oxidatively as an Oloroso. The result is a wine with some richness of Oloroso and some crispness of an Amontillado. Only about 1-2% to 2 of the grapes pressed for sherry naturally develop into Pelo Cantado. The name Pelo Cantado means cut stick in reference to a mark made on the cask when this style of wine is recognized. Since the wine was originally destined to be a Fino or a Amontillado, it will initially have a single stroke marked on the cask. When the overseer realizes that the wine is becoming a pelo cantado, he draws a cross or cut through the initial stroke or stick, resulting in a cross stroke or stick. At this time, the wine will be fortified to about 17.5% alcohol by volume to prevent spoilage from contact with the air. As the overseer continues to monitor the wine over time, he may feel it necessary to add more measures of alcohol to the cask to continue its development. These additional measures are marked on the cask and the more crosses, with the resulting wine being designated dos contados, tres cortados, etc. According to the number of cuts marked on the cask, the greater number of cuts, the older the wine. So here's an overall picture of the sherry process. With floor protection, it becomes a fresh style. With no floor protection, it becomes a nutty style. Under the fresh style, you have manzanilla and fino and pelo cantado. Under the nutty style, you have Oloroso and Cream Sherry. Cream Sherry is an Oloroso, which has had Pedro Jimenez added to it. Mm -hmm. 
So here are some recommended cherry producers. Some of these will be reviewed during this series. Emilio Lestal from Jerez, found in 1896. I'll be reviewing one of those. Gonzalez Bypass, also from Jerez, found in 1835. We're we'll doing a Fino Sherry from Gonzalez Bypass. Marquez de Real Tesaro and Jerez, found in 1860. Osborne from Puerto de Santa Maria, founded in 1772. I'll be reviewing a couple of wines from them. Pedro Domique from Jerez, founded in 1730. Sandeman, which is owned by a Scottish family in Jerez, founded in 1790. Valdo also located in Jerez, founded in 1837. And Venicola Hidalgo, located in San Lucar de Barramida, founded in 1792. So why share cast aged Scotch whiskey? Sherry casks, also known as batas or barrels, are a crucial part of the aging process of sherry wines and they've been used to age Scotch whiskey for well over 200 years. The first record of sherry being drunk in Edinburgh was in 1548, but it was in the 18th century when it became a fashionable drink. By then, sherry and rum punches were the preferred drinks of the roistering members of Scottish pubs, which were the trendsetters of the period. There was also an element of patriotism involved with many Scots either working for or owning sherry houses. Arthur Gordon established Bodegas Gordon, then a distant relative William joined his uncle to found Duff Gordon, while George Sandeman's port and sherry interests were handled in Scotland by his relative Thomas from his base in Perth. In those days, sherry would have been shipped to Glasgow and Leith and Cass, this coincided with a dramatic expansion of the whiskey industry. As there was no domestic forest in Scotland to use for casks, distillers turned to those being landed on the docks. These included rum and wine as well as sherry, but it was the latter that became the preferred option. Alrighty, so I hope you've enjoyed that video. If you didn't catch it all, uh, we can watch this again. <coughs> Excuse me, watch it again on the replay or uh, throughout this series when I'm um, covering Fino, Amatiado, Oloroso, a lot of that information will be repeated uh, when I do uh, a wine review, sherry review, as well as when I do a uh, whiskey review. So uh, don't worry about it if you didn't get it all. <laughs> It'll be repeated. Just keep watching this series. So I poured myself a little bit of the Red Breast Lustau, the uh, Emrut Intermediate Sherry, and the Balcones, and I put two teaspoons into this Balcones Broheria because it's bottled at 62.9% alcohol by volume. It's a whiskey that needs a little bit of time to really let the water integrate. Um, it'll take a lot of water, but also you don't want to drown it. So during the video, some comments were made. I'll address a few of them. In terms of pronunciation, no, pronunciation is not part of the sommelier training. It's not part of my certification. In fact, <laughs> I, I, so I trained for those. I trained with three master sommeliers for 18 weeks. And some of them, on some things, the pronunciation wasn't all that great. Particularly one gentleman, uh, with all due respect, his name is Alan. He's from Australia. And his pronunciation of French probably wasn't the best. Uh, another gentleman who was training with, he was from... Um, Alsace, uh, France. He was French. And so sometimes he wouldn't recognize uh, what Alan, Alan Murray, said uh, because he didn't recognize it just from his, uh, his inflections in pronouncing French words. He'd be like, oh, I didn't understand what you said. And then he would pronounce it correctly in French. So no, pronunciation is not part of the exam. Another thing about pronunciation is to take Spanish. Um, how they pronounce things in southern Spain is a difference than, say, in Galicia or in, in uh, Rioja uh, and uh, Roberto de Duero versus, say, down in the Sherry region. It's a little bit different. Spanish is different here in California. Spanish is the second most common lang language here in California. I lived in San Diego for eight years, four years working on the border between uh, Mexico or Mexico and California, and frequently, 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 frequently interacted with... Um, Mexican citizens coming into the United States, some legally, some trying to illegally. And you could tell where they were from based on their accent, whether they're from uh, Oaxaca, uh, from um, Baja, or from Mexico City. If they're from Mexico City, typically they sounded more closer to Spain than they did any of the bordering uh, cities. One of the key, I say, differences in pronunciation 
is I don't say, I don't do my th, th, th sound. I say Pedro Jimenez. This is more of a uh, California Spanish or California Spanish. When I interact all the time with people who speak Spanish here in, in, in California. M my accent is coming more from uh, Mexicans here in California than it is anything from Spain. And, and here in in uh, if you're Mexican living here in California or or, or or an immigrant, you would not say Pedro Jimenez. They would they don't go Pedro Jimenez. Okay, so I'm pronouncing it the way a, a California Mexican Spanish would. All right, enough of that. Enough pronunciation. If you ever get hung up on pronunciation and yet want to talk to Scottish people, they mispronounce my name. So, all righty. So most. Uh, <laughs> most um, sherry cask whiskeys, they're just going to say sherry cask. Or they'll say, you know, 10 years in bourbon, two years in sherry, or something like that, right? Most of the time, they're not going to specify as to what type of sherry it is. However, usually it's going to be Oloroso. Oloroso is probably the most popular type of sherry, although sherry is not super popular these days. So there's actually been a great reduction in uh, production of sherry in the Jerez region. A lot of the land that was once used for growing grapes is now being used for growing uh, grains and cereals, uh, just farmland rather than uh, grapes. So, alrighty. So most of this series, I will be focusing on Scotch, although I also have will have a uh, Pelo Cantado. Um, uh, Italian whiskey. I think it's Italian. It hasn't arrived yet. It should be arriving actually on Monday. Uh, and I've, ha I've had it before. Pelo Contado is the most difficult um, cast to find for a whiskey. I have a Bonohaven Pelo Contado, which I'll be getting, in getting into. Because only 1-2% to of sherry is Pelo Contado, that means there's not a lot of Pelo Contado casts out there. But I have one showing up. It's actually a grain whiskey. Um, it's kind of hard to get, but it is available around the United States. Some of the places that have it don't sell outside their, their state. Anyway, those are showing up on, on Monday. But, but um, um, it's one of the most awesome. I, it's hard to explain this. In, in this you know, how do I convey in a video and an audio to people who may not be familiar with wine just how awesome Pelo Cantado is? It is an absolute superb sherry. If you want to start getting the sherries and you happen to see a bottle of Pelo Cantado, pick it up. Now, most of your sherries, Finos, 15, 20 bucks. You know, they're not going to be super expensive. Uh, um, Amontillados, probably get really good ones for 22, 25 bucks. Pelo Cantados, 65, 70 bucks. They're going to be expensive because it's just a, a, a rare sherry, but they're absolutely superb. And Pedro Jimenez, you can get some cheaper ones. Osborne, you could probably get for about 18 bucks. I've got a bottle of it down here. And some of the better ones, you probably pay $60 to uh, $70. So, um, I've said this before, 90% of casks in the warehouses in Scotland are bourbon casks. Sherry used to take up a much larger percentage. But since some of the companies that own uh, bourbon producers also own Scotch distilleries, Makes sense. Hey, you can carry those casks over from the United States over in Scotland. But also, I think uh, bourbon casks are really an excellent base uh, for or platform or a conduit for aging uh, Scotch whiskey, either on their own, whether you're talking about first fill, second fill, or as a base, but what you're then going to build on, say, for a couple of years with some sort of sherry cask or even, say, a rum cask. So, to learn run, uh, bourbons, not all that difficult. Just pick up a bourbon. You get the sense of bourbon cask. Then try to get as much as you can. Try to get a first fill bourbon cask whiskey and then try it along with a bourbon. And you should be able to pick up some of those bourbon characteristics. I would say particularly some of the, uh, maybe some of the younger whiskeys, you're going to get more of that bourbon cask influence. Especially if they don't rechar the cask and remove some of those bourbon characteristics. Now getting in and getting in the sherry. Most of what you're going to um, pick up from a sherry cask whiskey is going to be reflective of Oloroso. But when you're describing, I've heard some whiskey tubers, you know, they're doing a sherry cask whiskey 
And they, 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 they describe the aromas as, oh, it smells like sherry. That's like saying, um, well, what is, you know, an apple smells like an apple. <laughs> you know, a pear it smells like a pear. What does that wine smell like? It smells like grapes. Okay. Okay. There's more to it than that. All right. There's more to it. It just smells like sherry. Yeah, you get sherry. But then what tells you is that sherry? What aromas and flavors? What descriptors should you be using that tell you, hey, this is sherry? Now, typically Oloroso or maybe Amontillado, you're getting those dried black fruit notes. Why? Why do you get dried black fruit notes from an Oloroso cask? And as you'll see as you go get into the series, but you don't get those from a Fino cask. I know I just covered a lot of information. I don't expect anyone here to remember necessarily everything that was covered if they hadn't covered this information before. But why do you get those dried black fruit notes? And particularly on the finish, I tend to get these nutty notes, right? Almonds, um, walnuts. By the way, almonds is pronounced, my dad said almonds. We have a lot of almond growers here. Uh, the way I pronounce almonds is probably somewhere between almonds and and, al, and almonds. Almonds. I just pronounce almonds a little differently. It, it just happens when you get older. Anyway, so why do you get those nutty characteristics? What this series is doing and in getting into sherry and explaining sherry is not just, yeah, you get these black fruit notes, all these nutty notes, but why? What is it about Oloroso Sherry or a month of Sherry or say marzipan notes from a Fino cask? Why is that? For me, it's always wanting to go deeper and deeper and deeper into a whiskey and want to understand it more. But for me, because of my background in wine and someone asked, you know, to have a background in wine, most people know. So I spent 20 years in wine. I'm a certified sommelier with a quarter mass sommelier. I'm a French wine scholar at the Wine Scholar Guild. I have a diploma from the Wine Spirit Educational Trust. Um, I have a degree in enology, winemaking. I worked for three different wineries. I've never worked full time in the wine industry. Frankly, they don't pay enough. Um, but that's my background in wine. Got into whiskey while studying for the Wine Spirit Educational Trust diploma because you know, one of the units was on spirits, and that was about a little over f about five years ago. So that's my background for those who don't know it. So. Wine has always been in on my mind, and when I have smelled and tasted sherry cask whiskeys and described them, even though I didn't say it verbally in my head, because of my background, I was always knew, oh, I'm getting these notes from this whiskey, and here's the reason why. And I, you know, I could go that whole everything from the climate to the grapes to the soil to the production method to the aging method, everything else. I knew in the back of my head what was giving me those characteristics in that whiskey. I just didn't really talk about all that because it was too much for the typical whiskey uh, viewer. They, they wouldn't be interested in, in all that. Well, now is the time to go that deep, to get that deep. Alrighty, so let's start off with the first whiskey. We are already 33 minutes into this um, live stream. So good transition to get into the whiskeys. So I've already reviewed this one. Uh, I absolutely love Red Breast. If you're going to start in Irish whiskeys, Start with red breast, pot still. Uh, I have the 12, I have the cast strength, and this is the less stout aged in a sherry cast, which I've already whiskey. But let me bring up my notes for this whiskey, and we'll talk about it just a little bit. All right, so the red breast single pot still Irish whiskey, less stout edition. Again, less stout is a bodega. Uh, cast seasoned with Oloroso sherry. It's bottled at 40% alcohol by volume. And of course, prices are always going to vary. It sells for about 65 bucks. Seems to me still be uh, readily available. Uh, my favorite of, of the red breasts have been, has been the, the cast strength. Um, it's just, it's like the 12 year old, but more oomph and more intensity of flavor. But this is really, really nice as well. So in an upcoming video, <clears throat> on Fino and the um, Tobomori 12, I talk about different things that can go on with a wine cask. You can have a wine cask whiskey that it can seem like, sorry, Red Breast sent me down an Irish whiskey rabbit hole. I have no, I'm smart. I have no idea why your thing was blocked. Uh, maybe because you used the word hole. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, there you go. So, one of the things, you can have 
a whiskey in which the, it just seems like they took wine and poured it into it because the wine is dominating the whiskey. And I don't like that. I would say typically it's more prone to get that from a port cast. It's very, very easy for port to sort of take over a, a whiskey. What are you talking about? About a barrel. I've had some um, bourbons that were, you know, port sherry, port, excuse me, port cast finished. And they were good. They're nice. They're sweet and stuff. But it, it did seem to me like the port was just poured into it. I don't think that's what they did. But it just seemed that way. Uh, Peter Jimenez is, is a very thick, goopy, syrupy wine. Um, it can also have that sort of intensity you want to take over as well. So when I can find a Pedro Jimenez cast that is really does justice so that it, it doesn't seem like they just poured, you know, uh, wine into the whiskey, nor, secondly, is the whiskey uh, over, just take over the wine so you can't tell that it's actually a wine cast either because that can happen as well. But there's a perfect harmony, a symbiosis between the wine cask and the whiskey. And I would say, I would say, uh, this, uh, the last style definitely hits it. Um, Angel, so RM Smart says, um, it is Angel's Envy is a good one. Um, this is at, Eric H says he thought it was at 46. No, this one's at 40%. I mean, this is at 40%. You might be able to find a 46 percenter, but this is at 46%. I mean, 40%. It's right there, 40% ABV. I showed it to you, but I mean, I don't know if you can see that or not. It's at 40% ABV. I wish it was at 46. I'd prefer it to be at 46, but it's 40%. So, you get the classic, I would say the classic um, pot still Irish whiskey character that sort of, um, it's melted butter or a, like a butter sauce. But the sherry, so you get that sort of the traditional sort of, some people think call it a butter cookie. It's almost like a butter croissant character to it. But the, the sherry cast, the fig, the dates, and the raisins, or meeting it halfway and, and blending in really, really, really well, really, really, and in, in, uh, in well, really well. There's this apple pie character, cinnamon, nutmeg, bacon spices. Joe F says his is forty six, so I don't know if you guys are talking about Angel's Envy or some other whiskey, or if you're talking about uh, the Lost Style. But this one's at forty. There's actually a little bit of maltiness there. There's some sweetness there. Some honey. Really, really, really nice. Hmm. So I'm starting with the Irish because I think out of the three of these, it's probably going to be the least um, overwhelming and tense. Definitely wanted to finish up with the Berharia since it's the biggest ABV. And the intermediate cask from Amrut, well, I'll put it in the middle. It's intermediate. Really, really, really nice. It's sweet up front. Get more of the honey notes. Sort of caramels, apple pie, cinnamon. About three quarters of the way back, just before you swallow, the sherry starts showing itself. It goes dry, and you get a little bit of that nuttiness. Now, based on the video that we just went with in my notes, the video that I just showed you, why do you get, or why do I get dried black fruit notes, and why do we get the nuttiness? That's really the importance. All this, I mean, as much as, sure, that'd be great if you can become fans of sherry, buy more sherry, so that the cast exists for a aging whiskey, but, and I, and I love Sherry. Um, but the, the really, in terms of our interest and focus on whiskey, the real issue is why do we get the dried black fruit notes and why do we get the almond notes, the or almond notes, as my dad used to say, those dry nutty notes on the back end. What is it about Oloroso Sherry that shows itself like this in the whiskey? 
if I tell you what, if anybody can right now in the chat can tell me, I'm going to send you free one of my coins. If you were paying attention, I'll, I'll mail you one of my coins, my challenge coins. Uh, if you're not familiar with my challenge coins, it's a major hassle to get to the post office. I basically sell these for 20 bucks, which I break even on the postage and the cost of the coin. If someone, want, if someone can tell me the answer that I'm looking for, why do we get the dried black fruit notes from an old roast sherry and then nutty notes on the back end? If someone could tell me. I'm smart says the nuttiness. Ah, uh, nuttiness is from the sherry. Uh, and I don't know. Joseph McNally says oxidation and time. Joshua Lowe says there is no floor. Yet yeah, it's in the video. Okay, um, so uh, you know what? Tenants from the cast, no floor protection. Okay, I think Joseph Mc McNally got it right. But Joshua Lowe also got it right. He got the more technical part. Uh, Michael C. 2019 says, uh, your first choice on the graph of the floor. All right, so the answer is both oxidization and floor. So those are both correct. So tell you what, Joseph McNally and Joshua Lowe, I'm going to send you both a coin. You both got half of it. Uh, uh, Joseph got the oxidization part, but Joshua got the part about the no floor, F-O-L-R. The reason why th th there's oxidization is because there's no floor. It's age oxidatively and not biologically. So uh, both of you guys, uh, I'm going to put up my email address. Let me see if I can find. I think I have it already on there. Um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da um, banners. Okay, so here you go. So, uh, Joshua Lowe and Joseph McNally. Here's my here's my um, email address. Send me your. Email, your mailing address to this address. This is an advertisement banner for if you want to buy a coin. Send me your mailing address at ericwait at yahoo.com. At ericwait at yahoo.com. So right there. Send me your, your mailing address in an email, and I'm going to send you one of my coins for pay, uh, for paying attention. Alrighty. You both got half of it right. Oxidation, but the reason why it, get, it gets oxidized is just because there's no floor. That yeast, that film, that's on there. All right. So... Gentlemen, you're able to give my hey, uh, Nancy Freddy, how you doing? How you doing? It's the development of rancio, which is the esterification of fatty acids. Nancy, if you want to get a little bit more technical, but in terms of from the video, remember when you're in a class, it's from what's in the what was taught, like what's in the textbook, right? It's going to be true. If you want to get more more in depth, but if I expect it, <laughs> even if I put that in the video. There's no in the world they're going to remember that, Nancy. So that is true. But in terms of, we're talking about the production process. That's the reason why. You can always go deeper. This is the, here's the reality. You can go so deep. You can start talking about the chemical compounds and start putting up graphs of chemical uh, formulations, right? I sat through a lecture with Dr. Don uh, Livermore from Weiser uh, at, uh, in San Francisco and it was an hour long. We tasted six, six whiskeys. And that's what he would do. He would put up all these. And you feel like you need a degree in chemistry in order to understand what he's talking about. And he's talking about the impact of cash. So that's one of the things I got to do is try to communicate in such a way that the average person is going to understand without feeling like someone needs a, a degree in chemistry. But Nancy, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Uh, and today is Friday. So I hope you have a very good uh, Shabbat uh, Sabbath uh, tonight. All righty. So that's that's up. Hey Nancy, send me the, send me your mailing address and I'll send you a coin. Send me I, I, if I haven't already. I I don't think I've mailed you one of these. Nancy, uh, send me your mailing address in my email, and I'll send you one of my coins. I'll send you one, one of my coins. So there's always a smarty pants in the crowd. There's always someone who's got to show up, show everybody up that they're the smartest in the class. If you guys don't know who that's, uh, she's a master blender. Uh, she's the brains behind uh, Joseph Magnus um, blending uh, Ironwood Distillery and many other pr many, many other producers, <laughs> many other producers. So I would expect no less. 
So <laughs> from Nancy being in, being in the room. Alrighty. So an absolutely superb whiskey. Mm. But if you're not experienced with Irish whiskeys, I would actually say first start with the Red, uh, red Breast 12 because that's sort of, I think it's probably one of the best pasta Irish whiskeys, but also it sort of gives you a better idea um, of a base to then understand the sherry cask influence on a pot still whiskey, right? So getting to wine cask finished whiskeys is great. It's fantastic. But I think you should probably start with a non-exotic peripheral whiskey, six more of the core whiskeys, a bourbon cask, then get into sherry cask, then get into wine cask, rum cask, and so on and so forth. Um, so, but I would say get the Red Breast 12 if you haven't had it yet. And then check out uh, the Lost Out. All right, let's get into our next one. Our next one is going to be the Amrut Intermediate uh, Sherry Cask. Does she get a coin? Yes, yeah, she gets a coin. If she just send me a mail, uh, send me the uh, uh, I love one. Yeah, just send me, <laughs> just send me a mailing address, and I'll and I uh, and I'll and I'll send you one. All right, let's get into uh, our next one. Um. It didn't read it sure. Okay, I'm gonna take I gotta take that other banner off. Uh there we go. All right. So Amarut. Amarut is an Indian whiskey. So because most of my series, we're gonna be getting into mostly Scotch whiskeys and a couple bourbons and one, I take Italian whiskey. I, I thought let's do some whiskeys outside of those tonight. So Amarut is an Indian whiskey. It's an intermediate sherry, Indian single malt whiskey. So this, it's kind of interesting. I don't think anybody else that I know have done this. It's an Indian single malt whiskey matured in ex Oloroso, just as a, the um, red breast is done in Oloroso, ex Oloroso sherry butt, then put into a, a bourbon cask. And just the, when you think all was well, they transferred it to a Spanish ex Oloroso sherry butt for another year. Um, it's bought at 57.1% alcohol by volume. Currently sells for about 130 bucks, but I bought five of these when they first came out. They were originally um, at the duty free in the airport, and then there were there was a short release on the market, and then they released them again. I was able to pick up like five bottles of this for 50 bucks each. So I still I think I have like two or three uh, left. Anyway, so that's our second whiskey. I'm gonna hope I'm gonna do a series on. Indian whiskey is in the near future. If you're familiar with First Phil Whiskey, he just did an absolutely killer video on Indian whiskey, sort of a big picture on Indian whiskeys. And sometime in the future, probably maybe in the fall after I finish the series, I'll do a short series on Indian whiskeys as well. Rampur is now uh, available here in the United States. Alrighty, so the Indian Immediate Shared Cast Whiskey. Now, one of the interesting things, not only do you have to study and get to understand uh, the... Everything from the difference the grains make. Water, does water make a difference? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> that's another deb debatable topic, depending on who you're listening to. Shape of the stills, height of the stills, the rate of distillation, whether it's doubles dis uh, distilled, triple distilled, whether it's a tall still, whether it's a short, narrow still. Um, whether, obviously, whether it's double distilled or triple distilled, whether it's pot still, whether it also has a grain whiskey done in a column still. Right, then they have different kind of types of casts, and then of course, climate is a big impactor of how the spirit is going to interact and engage uh, with the cask. Right, if you get to know and understand and be able to perceive the way in which a spirit engages with a cask, it'll be an indication of climate of where the whiskey is from. If you have Let's say it's somewhat of a heavy engagement with a cask, right? But it doesn't have any youth notes. Youth notes. That means that engagement, heavy engagement with the cask got there over a greater period of time. If it got there over a greater period of time, it must have taken place in a cooler climate. If it take place in a cooler climate, I have your uh, interaction with a cask, and yet without the youth notes of that new make spirit, 
Therefore, it was aged over a long period of time. Therefore, it must have been done in a cooler climate. If it's done in a cooler climate, then you're looking at Scotland, you're looking at Ireland, or if you're looking at more, something a little bit more obscure, some other country which is a lot cooler and takes longer to integrate, integrate with a cask. If you're getting a heavy imp, uh, oak or cask influence, and yet somewhere in there, there is this youthfulness of spirit to get that much extraction from a cask and yet maintain that youthfulness of spirit, that means climatically, it's, it's more intense uh, in order to get that heavy extraction out of a cask. You get what I'm saying? Okay, so this, we're getting a little bit into blind tasting there uh, and, and, and keys in understanding cask and aging and maturation and so forth. Um, but amaru root coming from India, if you do a little more research on it and the climate and the nature of the interaction of, of, of uh, the spirit, how much angel loss they have. This is the same true for, say, Cavalon in Taiwan, where they have a real high um, angel share loss. Texas, obviously, we're getting into Texas there. Okay, that's how you're going to tell uh, um, an Indian, a Texan, or a, or a Taiwanese whiskey as opposed to a scotch. All right, and, and that's in, in, a short, in a short. So what it comes down to then is maturation management so that you get what you want out of a cask without overstracting so quickly and so much and yet you still have a lot of those youth notes left um, and you don't sort of jump the shark. And so it's sort of like a mitigation of the intensity. And with Texas, it's not just a matter of intensity of heat, it's the crazy ass weather. <laughs> When we were there for the Bastards Ball, which I don't know if they're going to have. The, ooh, nice. Which I don't know if they're going to have this year. But it was like 40 degrees Fahrenheit when I showed up the day before an event. And the next day, it was like, I don't know, 80 degrees. In Texas, it's not just the intensity of the heat. It's the wild uh, swings of high to lows that, that can happen overnight. That's really probably one of the bigger factors in Texas. In contrast to, say, Kentucky. Mike Bennett. Uh, uh, it says, I think a whiskey study once samples sent uh, to my address. Uh, any sa <laughs> Did I miss some comments? By the way, if someone wants to address me, you have to kind of put my name in there. You could put an asterisk and start to type in Eric Waite and then the rest will show up and then it'll, it'll highlight in orange and that'll catch my attention. Then I know you're talking to me um, and not uh, just chatting amongst yourselves. Okay, cool. Yeah, I look, I, I've tasted Cavallon. I've never owned one. I've tasted three different Cavallons. I haven't reviewed them. They are expensive, but eventually I'll get around to it. So right now I have whiskey bottles on the floor right here. I have a new six foot by three foot case that's showing up. It's going to go here off camera so I can get these whiskeys off my floor. Right now I'm not looking to gain a lot of bottles. Um... Okay, um, Nancy, okay, you said you'll send me your uh, mailing address. Cool. I'll get the coin out. <sighs> Jaime says, is there a difference between sherry cast and sherry season cast? Yes. Well, <sighs> yes and no. Someone could have a seasoned sherry cast and just call it a sherry cast not t without telling you it's a seasoned cask. Um, actually, there's someone I would like to bring on um, a gentleman by the name of Vic that I met through the Edinburgh Whiskey Academy. He worked for Glen Morangy for 19 years. He's over in Scotland. Uh, if I can work out the schedule, obviously there's an eight hour time difference. I might be able to record an interview with him. I would like to get him on uh, to talk about more about how casts are sourced. In short, originally, as I said in the video, uh, towards the end, um, Sherry was being exported from Jerez into Scotland in casks, right? Eventually, I think it was like in the mid-1970s, the laws changed and you couldn't export sherry in casks. So it's been exported in bottles. The result was you didn't have uh, former sherry casks sitting on the docks. Um, Solera casks, there's, there's going to be too few of them. They're used over and over and over again, right? Uh, they're mostly used for blending. The, the, 
uh, Soleras are not used for extracting oak character into the sherry. They're used for the aging and blending process, right? If they're not, it's not, those are not about extracting from the oak. They're just a vessel for breathing because they breathe and for blending over time from Cardera to Cardera to Cardera. So they're not about extracting characteristics from the oak. It's about blending and the um, oxidative or biological process of aging sherries. That's really what they're about, right? So uh, the cast that you're gonna have, uh, basically you can have casts that are holding sherry until they get bottled, right? So you can put a, a sherry through a Solera, but before you bottle it, you put it into a cast for a couple of years because sherries don't have age statements, right? You don't getting a 12, 15 year old necessarily. They tend to, because you're blending, you're not gonna have vintages, right? Uh, yes, there are VORs and VRSs, which I didn't get into because it's just too much information. Um, so they're seasoning cast, but putting sherry into it for a couple years. What you have is uh, distillers like McAllen, who have long-term contracts with uh, bodegas uh, to use those casts uh, that are holding vessels for sherry for a while, and those season the cast, which then they put, then put the spirit in. So that's the long and short of it. All right. My name's popping up a whole lot here. Got, looks like I got a lot of questions. Um, oh, uh, Nancy was offering you a sample. Okay. I know we've uh, sort of talked a little bit offline. Uh, th that'd be awesome. Is there a difference between sherry cast and... Okay, I already covered that. Um, I'll go back. Da -da 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 -da. Nancy says, FYI, an Indian whiskey that I uh, co-created was Sundar Kumar, former master blender at Amrut, will be coming here, oh, to the States later this year. Would love to get a, sa uh, get, get a sample of it. Uh, what, would you love to get a sample of it? Oh, you got to twist my arm. Oh, oh, okay, if I have to. <laughs> yes, that'd be awesome. Wow, and that's someone I would, man, I don't know. So I live... For those, I live, depending on traffic, hour and a half, two hours from where Nancy lives. If there was a possibility of meeting him or somehow be able to interview him or ask a lot of questions, that would be a great learning experience. But yeah, that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, <laughs> um, Joshua Lowe says, can you, inst uh, can you instruct us on how different types of sherry cash are used for aging scotch and other types of whiskey in? I hear people talk about Sheephead cask and other types. Um, well, you have hog's head. I've, I've never heard of a sheep's head cask. There's a hog's head cask. I don't know what a sheep's head cask is. There may be such a thing. A hog's head cask is basically you've taken, well, usually it's bourbon cask. You've taken three uh, bourbon casks. You've broken them down. Um, so reformed them, recut them, put them together to, to make one hog's head. So uh, a bourbon cast is 250 and a hog's head, excuse me, a bourbon cast is like 200 liters. A hog's head is like 250 and a sherry butt is 500 liters. They can be like, like 650 liters, but on, on average. So a hog's head is usually around 250, whereas a normal bourbon cast is around 200 liters. So a hog's head is you've taken three bourbon casts, take them apart, put them together. They do some reshaping, put some put the heads on them and make a hog's head. So if there is, yeah, okay. <laughs> Josh, okay, hog's head. Hey, man, you never know. Maybe uh, in Iceland when they make Floki, Floki uh, a, 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 you know, where they, <laughs> where they use sheep dung or whatever for, for fuel, maybe they got sh sheep head <laughs> cast as well. Who knows? Uh, the life is crazy. All right. Let's get into this whiskey. So, those are those classic sherry notes. I'm guessing what I'm really, really, why do they go, I've never seen this answer. Why do they go Oloroso to bourbon to back to Oloroso? I don't know. My guess is if you want to dial in how much sherry influence, that might be a way of doing it. You got your sherry, ooh, really, in, you know, Intense extraction from sherry. Okay, we're going to back that off with some bourbon cask. Okay, you back it off a little bit with some bourbon cask influence. You know, kind of cranking in. This is a guess. This, this is an educated guess. Okay, 
Now we got it kind of where we want it. Okay, now let's sort of let it finish a time for another year in a sherry cask. That's my guess, but I could be wrong. But I, I would like to know why do they go sherry, bourbon, sherry? If there's another reason why, maybe they're going new sh newer sherry, bourbon, and then more of a neutral pre previously used sherry cask. That's not going to be as intensely, so you're not going to have a lot of heavy extraction. Who knows? I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why they do that. But I would say the sherry cask is really nicely um, balanced in this. It's not, it do, yeah, it does have some of those dry black fruit notes, uh, but it's not going to be like the uh, Allardyce um, Glendronic. That's sort of more of a smack in the face. Now, you can be in the mood for a sherry bomb, right? I like a sherry bomb. Uh, the Powers Irish Whiskey is a sherry bomb, and I like it. Um, you can be in the mood for it. So it's all about more about what you're in the mood for. But this is really nicely balanced. I'm getting a little bit more... Yeah, you kind of get some apple and pear notes, but I'm getting a little bit of like grilled stone fruit notes. A little bit more of a peach, even like an apricot. A question I have, this and that I have, I have gotten citrus notes, orange notes, or like chocolate covered orange notes from sherry cask. It's not very common. It's not very common, but sometimes I get it. And it'll be like, you know, like Christmas time. I don't see people doing that these days, but when I was a kid, People at Christmas time, about during the holidays, they take an orange and they put cloves in it, and it would be this sort of citrus, spicy smell. Or in a punch, you take orange slices and you put it into punch, and you put cloves in the punch, so you get that kind of citrus and spice character going on there. I get a little bit of that. If you're in the UK, they describe it as Christmas cake. If you're in Italy, you, you describe it as panettone roll. That's sort of there's a little bit of a bready note there with the dried uh, fruit note as well. Even though it's at fifty, was it fifty seven point one? Yeah, fifty seven point one. I'm getting a little tingle on those, but it's not huge. Um, Joseph McNally, Eric, what's your opinion on Moscatel Sherry? It's super sweet. Uh, I'm enjoying a nice one from Lasta. Okay, right now. Uh, I, I know some uh, whiskeys have used it. So, um, the uh, Yellow Spot. The ye Yellow Spot uses a muscatel. It also, it also uses a... Um, um, man, my brain just went blank. A Malaga. It also uses a Malaga cask as well. Well... Interesting. All right, on the palate. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> I couldn't say anything, so I had to express it in my face. Wow, that's intense. So I've, I've gone through a couple of bottles of this, but it's been a while. In fact, the last time I went through this was a bottle I brought down to Texas. Really, really intense. It could use a little bit of water. Um, the nose is confirmed. I'm getting a little bit of a numbing character. It's undoubtedly due to the, the high alcohol. I wasn't expecting it. I don't remember. It's a little warm here today. It's about 90 degrees. I'm further inland, so Nancy, closer to the ocean, I'm guessing she's probably at least 10 to 15 degrees cooler uh, than where it is where I'm at. So we get more intense summers here, especially on the fire season. But wow, yeah, really, really, really intense. It's really, really concentrated. Basically, yeah, Michael Gonzalez, yes, an explosion of flavor, but I don't remember it being that intense. Um... Maybe it's because it's been a while, but also when you're in a warmer room and you're warmer, alcohol can seem exaggerated. So keep that in consideration. So I, I don't would say hmm. tons of sweetness up front. I would say it doesn't necessarily have a lot of transition. A lot of what you get in the front and the middle is pretty similar. 
I don't get that nutty character from the Oloroso that I was getting from the Lustown, um, Redbreast Lustown. It mostly stays sweet. It's sort of, um, there, I would say there is a little bit of almond character. So the, the dry character, the nuttiness, and the almond comes from the oxidative character, nature of, or um, oxidative aging and not having the floor from the sherry. I am now, now that I, after swallowing and waiting for a second, and now it's showing up. So it's on more on the finish. Uh, after you swallowed for a while, it starts to show up. And it reminds me of an almond roca. I haven't had one of those in a long time. If you're not familiar with almond roca, um, there are candy, there are round chocolate candies in an almond. And each one has like its own little foil in it. And it's like, you know, you just want to bite. Really, 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 really good. Um... I would say it sort of has that almond roca character to it. Now, price-wise, I bought these for 50 bucks. Would I pay 130 for it? $130, it's now rubbing shoulders with a lot of your really, really expensive Scottish whiskeys. Um, I might not. I think the fusion you can probably get for... Hey, um, Phil, how you doing? Or I'm could be Phil and Deepa. How you doing? Another neighbor, uh, Phil and Deepa, uh, they live south of San Francisco, uh, it's also probably 20 degrees cooler than it is here. <laughs> so Phil says five barrels to make four hogsheads. I thought it was three barrels to make one hogshead. I, in fact, it, from my notes, when I've read, that's still the picture that's in my head is three is a three to one, but he's got um, a five to four ratio. I will look that up. I will look up th that up again. Ah, Jaime says his favorite sherry bomb is the Abelor Abudna, which I've got one of those. Yeah, you can get still. I can get this for about sixty bucks. So, would I rather have this Emerald Intermediate Sherry Cast or the Abelar Abudna? Even if you could get them for the same price, I would probably take the Abelar. Um, and the fact that it could be thirty, forty bucks cheaper adds to the bonus. Yeah, I would. I would go with the Abelar Abudna. Don't get me wrong. This is a very nice whiskey. Um, I think it's good to get to know Indian whiskeys, but I wouldn't pay $130. I wouldn't pay more than $100 uh, for this whiskey, and I didn't. But if you shop around now at the current going prices, I think $130 bucks is too much. It's very, very nice. That's just too much money. Um, there's no reason. They're, they're not in the EU. They're not undergoing the tariffs. There's no reason to jack up the prices to go along at the same prices as the Scotch whiskeys uh, that are, uh, you know, been hit with tariffs. Mm, 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 mm. Really, really nice. So, I would probably go, you know, at least a solid 90 points uh, with the um, uh, Red Breast Lustow. The Amarut, I'm probably going to go 87 points. I don't think it has quite the depth and the breadth uh, and the variation from front to the middle into the finish. Um, it, has, it does have a nice finish to it. Um, but I just don't, it's, and, and that's the challenge of the intensity of the climate there, but it is very, 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 very good. If tasted blind, could I tell the difference between it and a scotch? I would say it has an intensity of extraction from a cast, which to me is a flag, the, just the way it's done, because it doesn't seem old. It doesn't seem like it has a lot of age on it. And yet it has that intensity extraction from a cast that tells me it's youth, which tells me it's a non-scotch. Uh, Michael uh, C. 2019 says, Buna 12 is sherry as well, right? Yes, yes. But uh, the Buna 12 is um, a bourbon cask and a sherry cask. Alrighty, so let's get on to our third one. Uh, the um, Balcones Braharia. Unfortunately, this one is not distributed. Let me bring up the slides here. So uh, I picked this up down there in Texas in my last trip. This is the Brujeria 
Texas single malt whiskey finished in Oloroso and, oh, excuse me. Sorry, I had to belch. Uh, so this is Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez Sherry Cast, bottled at 62.9% alcohol by volume and 120 bucks. I absolutely love this whiskey. It definitely needs a lot of water. Uh, this is like not whiskey, but a whiskey concentrate. You know how, you know, you maybe buy a, a little can of orange juice concentrate and you put it into your, your, uh, your jug or whatever. And then you have to add two cans of water in to get it to be, you know, a normal orange juice. That's what this whiskey is like. It's they're very, 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 very intense. Um, Unfortunately, the production is, and the distribution uh, is fairly small, and so you're only going to find it down there in Texas. So, um, if you're in Texas, the other one I really, I really like this whiskey, and the um, Hechiceros, and the Hechiceros, uh, which is a run, which is uh, a port cask. A port cask is really, really nice as well. Now, look at the color on this puppy. That is dark there's no added coloring uh there's no filtration other than may they might do particle filter filtration you know to make sure you don't be floating bits of cast going in there uh but but uh that and that this is typical of balcones it's typical of uh texas it's very 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 common all right smart says you're killing me with the whiskey uh i can't buy it i sorry no, there's not much I can do about that. You either got to get out and travel or find friends who can get it for you. This is definitely one that needs some water, as I said before. Now, um, there's a few whiskey tubers, I'm not going to name names, who swirl their whiskeys like you do a wine. Um, and I've said this before, so I'm trying to repeat myself. <sighs> the head space on a, on a glass, whether you're talking about a wine glass or a whiskey glass, is the space in which um, the wine or spirit is interacting with air. What you're really smelling is not necessarily what is evaporating from the wine or spirit, but necessarily from the base, although that goes on as well. But if you turn the glass, you coat the side of the glass so that you then see the leg is going down, right? And then it begins to sort of, like a better term, separate there. And that's where you're getting the aromas from that in this head space right here. That's why you don't want to fill it up. That's why Max, I'm only going to put right there. You're smelling from in here. You're smelling from in here. If you shake, like Ralphie says, no shaky shaky. If you're swirling it, a whiskey, like the way you're doing a wine, you're going to exaggerate the alcohol. Um, and I think you'll do better in blind tasting if you don't, that's why I take it and I turn it sideways at an angle like this and give it a nice gentle roll. Or um, Food Quick, he does the anaconda with his elbow. He has this funny thing where he does, I would give myself tennis elbow doing that, but anyway. Now, funny thing is as intense and big as that is, it's not smacking upside the head. It's very, very dark. Dark black fruit notes. The fig, the dates, the raisins there, but the Pedro Jimenez is making its presence known. Dark prunes. There is a little bit of oaky wood character there as well. There are some vanillas, caramels, loads of spice. I would say almost. Almost a slight chocolate note. But you get mostly really dark black fruit notes. And that's definitely the, the Pedro Jimenez uh, playing in there. I, I'd say it's kind of wise, if you're going to use PX, if you can kind of balance it out, because Pedro Jimenez is so domineering, to kind of, you can kind of control it or mitigate some of the intensity of it if you want to have that, those darker black fruit notes. Uh, by using some Oloroso as well. All right, on the palate. Wow. Ooh. Wow. 
I can sit here for the next five minutes and just keep saying, wow. Wow. Now, I put in two teaspoons of water. It is not biting. Even though it's at 62.9% alcohol, I'm not getting a bite. It is silky. It is full body. There's a fullness in the mouthfeel. Getting those dark black fruit notes. Getting a little bit of not it's close to black licorice, uh, close to black, but it's not quite as intense as like as like anise. Really intense, bold, and powerful. This is what Balcones is known for. It's more on dried plums, prunes, prunes, dried plums, prunes. It's more on the prune character than on the figs and the dates. Although those other dried black fruits, figs and dates can be there as well. This is more of a, a prune character in there, which I think is sort of typical of PX. I like, it's not, this is not like biting. Um, it's actually kind of like this full, full bodied, heavy mouthfeel. There's a thickness to it. It's not syrupy or goopy, but there's sort of an oily, thick mouthfeel. It sort of coats your mouth. The fact that they're not stripping out all the oils, you know, doing that filtration is what's going to give you that texture and that mouthfeel. I wouldn't say it necessarily has a huge development from front to middle into the finish, but what is there, I really, really like. It has boldness. It has intensity of flavor. Um, the funny thing is, when I had this before, it's been a while since I've been into it, I remembered more malt character showing up um, being with water being a little bit more scotch-like. That's not showing up now, but this is my third dram. It may be because, but because I was having it on its own, maybe because I've already had two drams. The one preceding it was, you know, the Emirate was a real high ABV. Um, but I remember before getting more of a malt character on it so that with water, it seemed a little bit more like a Sherry Bomb, like a Glendronic. But that might be because of the previous whiskeys. Wow. There's this herbal, that black licorice character is really showing up more on the, on the back end. The herbal character, the spiciness, and it's sort of the, the, the prunes and the spiciness that sort of lingers into the finish. A really, really nice whiskey. Um, this is one that does really, 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 really well on ice. Um, I love, particularly on a hot day, it's like 90 degrees here, 90 degrees Fahrenheit here today. I love a bourbon, a high ABV bourbon, or a high ABV Texas whiskey on a couple uh, uh, ice cubes on a hot day. That's the way I really like to drink my whiskeys. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Alrighty. So I don't know if I'm going to get down back down to Texas this year. Uh, they have resumed classes down at the Whiskey Academy. I think they're probably already filled up. Uh, I'm probably gonna have to wait till next year. I don't know if they're doing the Bastards Ball this year. I haven't heard anything. My guess is that, you know, they sort of a wait and see how the COVID crap, you know, unrolls. I got my first shot by the, by the way today, my first COVID shot, and I'm feeling fine. Uh, it feels like somebody, it feels like a, like a Charlie horse, like somebody went a little bit, hey, you son of a gun, what'd you do that for? You know, that kind of a thing, but it's not real bad. Hopefully it won't be bad over the weekend. In a couple of weeks, I get the second shot. Uh, I get the Pfizer shot. So I, if anybody's scared of getting it, I'd say thus far, I'm fine. And they didn't tell me I couldn't drink whiskeys. So there we go. Uh, Nancy says, my apologies. Shabbat uh, roast chicken is ready to pull out over the oven. So I'm going to have to run. Uh, shalom. Um, shalom Aleichem. Uh, have a uh, good night and good Shabbat. Thank you very much uh, for tuning in. I always appreciate it. It's awesome. 
Uh, Molesa says, thoughts on Ederdauer? A very different share expression compared to Glendronic. For example, I'm exploring, exploring the first signatory. So my, my, my I, bleh, 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 sorry. I have more experience with Balekin, which is the peated uh, whiskeys from Ederdauer than I do with Ederdauer itself. Um, so I've got a few um, Balekin casts uh, here. Uh, in fact, I have uh, a Burgundy cast, which is an unbelievable whiskey, awesome whiskey from Ederdauer. Um, so it's been a while, probably been three years since I've had one, just one or the other from the a lineup from Ederdauer. So Shari, I could, at this moment, I couldn't tell you, I, w I couldn't give you an honest impression at the moment, at the moment. Um, okay, Eric H. says they said they had planned to do everything that, they can to do to have bashers ball this year. All right. Well, if they have it, I will be there. They, uh, it's on a weekend, so typically fly in on a Friday, fly out on a Sunday. So I will be there if they have the bashers ball. I, I will definitely be there uh, this year, and hopefully we uh, we'll have some nice weather when we're down there as well. Alrighty. So we've been at this for uh, an hour and twenty one minutes. So on Sunday, my first video will kick off. It'll be on. Um, Tio Pepe Fino, um, Sherry, and that's just a little bit of that. We're going to get more into Fino Sherry, and I'll be doing the Tobomori. It's a superb whiskey, 12-year-old Fino cast whiskey. I actually have two of those, uh, one from here, and if I get to teach again, I'll, I'll, I'll use it in a cast. So I've been buying doubles of, of all these Sherry cast uh, whiskeys, so that if I get to teach, I can bring it with me and teach somewhere. Um, so in fact, I have two of the Palo Cantado from Bonahabin and those were 500 a pop and very hard to get anyway. So uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. These are absolutely fantastic whiskeys. I would recommend all of them if you can find them and afford them. Uh, really, really nice. I would say out of the three, uh, the one probably the most must buy is going to be, and the most, uh, uh, easier, most available. It's going to be the Red Breast Lestal. The Red Breast Lestal. Probably the easiest to get. And probably out of all three of them, the most affordable. And just a really superb, excellent uh, Oloroso Sherry Cask Whiskey. Again, I uh, hope those who are getting a coin. By the way, this tells you if I do more quizzes uh, and someone can answer, it means you got to pay attention. Uh, you can, so you can answer the quiz so you can win a coin. All right. If you haven't already, please like this uh, video. Hey, Jack White, how you doing, man? Um, so give this video a uh, thumbs up. If you're watching on the replay, if you have any comments, if you have any questions, leave them down below. And always, I want to thank uh, my patrons for supporting this work and for everyone just tuning in. Hope everyone has an absolutely fantastic weekend. And next Friday, we'll be back same time, hopefully, Lord willing, uh, same place as we continue our study of Sherry and Sherry Cast Whiskeys. Cheers. Oh, I need my outro.